all you have to do is ask a few questions and customers it doesn't matter who they are they will go they will go because just like i am introverted and i'm being extroverted now i'm extroverted because i'm passionate about this topic i'm passionate about what i do i'm passionate about the customers and the industry that i serve it's no different when i engage or anyone engages with a customer you just need two three two three questions they will go and then from there you can take it in any direction you want but it can be as simple as tell me about your day they'll go what's your biggest challenge they'll tell you and then they'll probably tell you three more um how do you overcome that uh, how do you drink coffee when you have these gloves on and you can barely pick up the coffee cup and it's freezing cold up they'll tell you Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword laden schmaltz, real world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. Any industry, and our marketing industry is no different, they've got a pack mentality. We say certain buzzwords and share certain ideas, but we can hear them ad nauseum to the point where they just kind of wash over us. They don't really mean anything. Yeah, we nod in agreement in a networking event with a drink in our hand, but do we actually do anything about it the next day? Not really. We're just going to go back through the motions, executing a campaign, buried an email, hearing Slack knock notifications. So here's one for you. Here's a great example of a buzzword. Put yourself in the customer's shoes. How many times have you heard that? Now, how many times have you really done it? I mean, I like the idea, but like really doing it? Well, my next guest actually has. She literally got out of the office, put on the customer's shoes, or in this case, steel-toed boots and try to experience what her customer's day is really like. Joining me now to share that experience, along with many more lesson-filled stories, is Sarah Hodges, the CMO of Procore Technologies. Thanks for joining me, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Let's take a quick look at your background so people understand who I'm talking to, why they should listen. Uh, Sarah worked at Autodesk for 12 years, leaving as a senior director of the construction business line. She was vice president of product marketing strategy for PTC. She actually came back to Autodesk for another four years as vice president of product management. And for the past year, she's been the chief marketing officer of Procore Technologies. Procore Technologies is a public company listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It reported $720 million in revenue in 2022 an increase of 40% year over year, and $1 trillion in construction volume has run on its construction management software platform. You heard me right, that is trillion with a T. And Sarah manages a team of about 300 people at Procore. So Sarah, give us a sense, what is your day like as CMO of Procore? Oh, what is a day like as CMO at Procore? It's very busy, um, but it's filled with what I would like to say sort of three different categories of where I spend my time. So the first one, and I loved what you said in the intro, Daniel, because I truly believe this is, is being connected with customers. So there isn't a day that passes for me where I'm not either emailing a customer, slacking a customer, getting a customer on a, on a Zoom call, because uh, I think that's critically important to making sure we're validating our messaging, we're saying relevant with our customers customers. We're hearing what's top of mind for them in terms of challenges that they're facing in the industry. So always a customer component in, in any day that I am, uh, I'm working. The other piece would be spending time with the team. So Procore, as you mentioned in your, your intro, it's grown significantly over the past year alone. Uh, and so you can imagine that that takes a lot of evolution. So I spend a lot of my time with my team helping us stay true to the vision that we have as an organization, helping us see what it's going to take to accomplish that, uh, deepening our accountability across the teams, looking at metrics across the full funnel, uh, challenging each other, challenging our teams to, to think not just about how do we continue to grow, but how do we continue to grow by being relevant to our customers? And then I'd say the third piece of my day is working with my stakeholders internally. So as the CMO, I spend a lot of time with my head of product, a lot of time with my head of sales, and customer success because I am a huge believer 
that in order to have any facet of a marketing role, you have to be in lockstep with the customer and you have to be in lockstep with custom, with uh, product and with sales and customer success. And so that third prong of where I spend my, my, my day is super important to make sure that marketing is relevant and how we go to market and is in lockstep. And in some cases, even driving the execution of our sales and our customer success team to make sure we are meeting the needs of customers. So long way of giving you an answer there, Daniel, but it's really three, three buckets of time. Customers, always customers, appreciating what they do, building empathy for them. The second one was with the team, driving us towards the vision that we have and making sure everyone is in lockstep towards that. And the third one is making the three legs of the stool steady and complete because the only way to go to market is to have synergy between marketing product and our sales organizations. Yeah, I, I love that. And I know we only call the first one customers, but it sounds like really all three are customers, right? I mean, yes. in a sense, what the customers that buy our product, the customers that, you know, the actual employees that are making it and the rest of the company. Um, so I like that. And you've got a lot of lessons here from your career about how you made things to make that happen. So let's see what we can learn from you, Sarah. Um, I like to say, you know, I've never been in any other industry. I've never been a podiatrist or an actuary or something. But like as marketers, if one thing is like we get to make things, right? That's what yeah. makes it fun. So let's see what we can learn from you. Uh, your first lesson is, it is okay to think outside the box, but make sure you don't create surprises. And I'm guessing this is in relation to that kind of third leg of the stool you were talking about. Yes, 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 yes. Actually, it touches it touches all three all three of the the areas I just described. But yes, it definitely comes in with that that three legged stool too. So, um, this story is is a lesson that I I hold very near and dear to my heart. Um, the story begins where uh, I had the opportunity to, as a marketer, build something and be very innovative in how how we went about that. And so, at the time, the team and I brainstormed. Um, this was during my time at Auto desk. So there was connection to the industry that, that I'm in today. And uh, we knew that uh, reaching our primary customer, which was in construction, meant being where they were. And so the team and I came up with at the time what we thought was a really innovative idea to basically surround the construction site and find ways to engage our target audience by being there right in person. And so we came up with this idea to uh, bring food trucks into, into the construction site. And we thought to ourselves, okay, Okay. This is a new area for the company at the time. So our brand wasn't necessarily very well known. And so, uh, and when it was known, it was known for something adjacent to, to the objective we were seeking, which was we were no more as a design company and less as a construction company during my time there. So we came up with uh, a campaign, a campaign name, um, campaign objectives that, that were accomplished by bringing this food truck to the site and demonstrating our technology and having conversations. Uh, but the, the, the lesson I learned here is as part of this idea, we took innovation um, I wouldn't say too far, but we took it to a place that, that created some provocative discussions internally where our campaign name meant not using the company's brand at the time and coming up with uh, a campaign name that, that we believed would resonate with the customers, would start to connect them to the company at large, uh, but didn't leverage the current, the current company's brand in a way that it should have done. And the lesson I learned was that the campaign was very successful in that we met our objectives, we reached the number of signups that we wanted uh, at the time. Time by, by being on these construction sites, we built new relationships, all of it seemed to go swimmingly well. The lesson I learned, however, was because that campaign was different in, in many different ways, both in terms of how we were engaging with customers, how we were reaching them, but most importantly, different in that we did not leverage the company's brand in the way all of our other campaigns did, that I neglected on the team's behalf to get buy-in from the three legs of the stool all the way up. And what ended up happening actually was an executive walking into a coffee shop and standing behind someone who was part of our campaign who had a t-shirt on that very small font had the company's brand and very big font had the campaign brand uh, that surprised him. Um, and I'll be very open and vulnerable and say this was actually the CEO at the time. So not someone you want to, you want to surprise. Um, and so the lesson I had was how important it is to be innovative, come up with creative ideas that do accomplish your objectives, which this campaign did, 
but you have to, you have to, you have to get buy-in. Um, and it doesn't always mean you have to walk into the CEO's office, right. Or get on a zoom with the CEO and make sure they know what you're doing, but you have to leverage your stakeholders, your network, your levels of management, right. To get their buy-in and their support and have them advocate and champion for you and your behalf. And this lesson for me was, I honestly, as I look back, I got so excited and so wrapped up uh, in the idea and, and the execution of this new idea. And the team was so motivated and it had such an impact in connecting the team to the industry and to the customers and did drive the objectives um, that that initial excitement made me forget the importance of, of getting that buy-in. So it was a, a lesson I, I hold true today to re always remember you, you cannot do things in a silo, even when they're exciting and they're innovative and they're new, or even when they're impactful, uh, making sure you get everybody bought in and they understand why you did something and why you might be approaching something that way. You may, they may agree with it. They may disagree with it, but that's another, another conversation. But the lesson is get that buy-in, get that advocacy, get that support, um, and make sure you don't create surprises for people, particularly senior executives, because we never want to surprise them. It's important that they can advocate and be in the know. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I think you want them to understand the context too, right? So Absolutely. I guess your CEO saw it out of context at a coffee shop, but if he had previously understood the context, he might've felt differently about Absolutely. it. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So you said another conversation. Let's talk about that other conversation. You might got by and you might not, right? Because this is a key issue selling internally. I mean, marketers struggle with us. They tell us that. So I wonder like when you're selling a plan internally, how do you build credibility for it? And how much do you share the downside or weakness of the plan, like in this case, I mean, I was part of it, like it wasn't, you know, normally with our brand logo. And I asked because, for example, we've learned in, you know, marketing, when you're marketing a message to the customer, like sometimes helping and sharing that downside or weakness, you can even get them bought in more because they understand like the holistic solution for themselves and they trust you more. So yeah. I mean, I've written about before even uh, like a subject line test, I remember we did where a weakness subject line beat a typical incentive subject line, right? As marketers were so focused on incentives, but kind of, you know, sometimes sharing that weakness. So when you're selling internally, how do you do it? How do you, what have you found works well? And am I way off base here? Or is there some element there of just kind of being laying your cards on the table and saying, Hey, here are the pros and cons. Here are the strengths and weaknesses. Oh, you actually are, are bringing up something that, uh, I, I really, I really value. So I'm actually going to start there and then I'm going to talk about the process that, that I take that may not, may not be right. Right. It's just, it's the one that, that I found to be effective for me. But Daniel, what you made me think of is vulnerability. I actually yes. think one of the most powerful things, and it's not you do, you can't just do it and be vulnerable, right? You have to, you have to actually be vulnerable. You have to operate that way. You have to communicate that way, but, but being vulnerable, I believe is the key to everything, not just getting buy-in, but it's building trust, right? It's, it's getting teams aligned with you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, vulnerability came to mind as you, as you asked that question, because I do believe really strongly that the best way to get buy-in for plans or get feedback on plans is to be vulnerable, that it probably isn't the right thing. Um, and that there's more thinking to do or more ideating to do or more championing to do. So what I have found to be effective is, collaborating and coll not collaborating for the sake of collaboration, but collaborating with the three legs of the stool, making sure they, they see the idea, they hear the idea, they see the plan as the plans being built and that they are given an opportunity to give feedback and that they're also given the opportunity to give feedback that either validates or invalidates how you might be feeling about the plan. So, and that's where the vulnerability piece comes in. So if I look back on, on that campaign idea, I was just sharing on that camp, it was more than an idea. We executed it. But if I think back to that campaign, I had buy-in from my, my primary stakeholders, including my team and, the, and a few of the supporting teams, but I didn't have buy-in across, you know, a bigger constitution of, of stakeholders, whether they were up in the org or further across in the org and had uh, adjacency to it. And if I was to do it all over again, I would apply other lessons that I've learned, which is you have to get everybody exposed to it. You have to give people your point of view and your context for why you're doing something. You have to be open and vulnerable about the things that maybe you're not sure about. Like if I look back on that campaign, I had no idea if it was going to work or if we were going to get told to actually, you know, leave the construction site and never come back. Um, it could have gone really, really badly. Um, but I think being open about that and saying, I don't know, if this is right, I don't know if this is going to work. What do you think? And giving people the opportunity to weigh in and being open and honest about 
the fact that something might fail, but that you're going to get a learning from that. You're going to get something from it um, that's going to help you iterate and evolve in the future is really important. So, so for me, the best way to move forwards is always be open and vulnerable, give the context, bring people in to become aware of what you're trying to do, open the door for feedback. I mean, you have to be clear about when you have to stop the feedback because at some point people have to disagree and commit and you have to move forwards. But giving that opportunity to people to weigh in, being open and vulnerable about the things that you don't have figured out or that you're not sure about, I think actually creates more buy-in naturally because people realize, oh, they don't have it all figured out, but they're asking me for my opinion and they're being open and honest about what it is that they're trying to accomplish. And I understand why they're doing it. So for me, vulnerability, collaboration, transparency about what you do know and you don't know and why you're doing it, that's the key to, to getting buy-in and, and driving something, whether it's going to be successful or not. Um, that's why you define the metrics and, and you're always going to have a learning from it, but it comes back to those things for me. Well, speaking of, we talked about trying something radically new for a brand. Let's talk about trying something radically new for a career. And it seems like vulnerability played a key role in this as well. Uh, you said to grow as a marketing leader, make the leap to a new, unfamiliar, even uncomfortable role. And <laughs> I would imagine you'd have to be, allow yourself to be pretty vulnerable to do that. So how did you learn that lesson? Oh, oh my goodness. As, as you said it back to me, then I, I, I felt the, I felt my body tense. Um, <laughs> I, I can say that this was, uh, yeah, this was the most uncomfortable I've, I've ever been as I talk about I talk about this role. And, and I credit the people that trusted me to put me in the role at the time. You know, my 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 boss did um, and she, she took a chance on me and, and she knew it was important for me to go try something different. Um, but I was extremely, extremely uncomfortable. So just to set a bit of context, my, most of my career has always been business strategy, go to market marketing. That is what I, I live and breathe. I, I, it's my passion. Um, it's why I'm in the role that I'm in today. Uh, but I knew that in order to be the best marketer and maybe even one day you know, become a CEO, that's always been a, a desire of mine. I knew I had to have an understanding and empathy for other functions and other aspects outside of ones I'd worked within and had managed directly. Uh, so the role that, that, that we're referencing was to run product and development. Um, and so the product side of it from sort of a product management perspective didn't, didn't scare me as much because uh, obviously there's a big sort of connection between marketing and product in terms of thinking about the market analysis, thinking about the personas, uh, thinking about how you bring a product to market. But development was something you know I, I never had any any connection to um, directly, right? I, I I didn't come from a from a development background. Definitely didn't understand the the, the, the terminology and the lingo. Um, definitely couldn't say, hey, I've done that before. You know, here's what I've learned. Let me let me share with you my experiences. So I was immediately uncomfortable. That level of uh, discomfort only increased, Daniel, as I got further and further in the, within the team, because I realized very quickly that the levers I had used previously, um, outside of pure leadership levers, levers of experience, levers of I've done that role, or I've seen that role, or I've, I've been in a team that had to do part of that role, there was no examples of that. I'd never been an engineer. I'd never been a developer. Um, I'd never had to uh, take something, right, and then move it into production. I'd never had to respond to uh, a, 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 an engineering crisis. I, I had no, nothing to say. I know how you're feeling. Um, and I also uh, didn't always understand the terminology being used because it wasn't a domain I, I had expertise in. And so I realized that very quickly. And then I realized very quickly that this was a moment where I, had to lean on all the other things that I, I knew I had learned and that I'd begun to hone, which was what makes a strong leader. And one of the things that I remember someone you know, teaching me was you know, always be curious, always make sure you're asking questions and always lead on the people in the room that do things that you, you don't have experience in. So I very quickly had to pivot and, and focus on, okay, who are my leaders? Um, what expertise do they have? Uh, how does that complement me? And how do I position them to go deep into the areas that, that I can't go into because I wouldn't know left or right or right or wrong? Um, I need their technical expertise. And then how do I help coach and guide them to make sure that they're directing the questions in the right way in areas where I may have what I call spidey senses about things, but I don't have the knowledge and the expertise to actually 
validate or invalidate. Um, so I was very uncomfortable because I'd sit in meetings and I'll be honest, and the team knew this, they could see right through it. I didn't know what they were talking about most of the time, but I knew what we had to do as an organization to meet the objectives. And so I just had to lean back on, okay, be curious, ask questions, activate the people that I do know have this knowledge and expertise to go find me the answers um, that I think we need as a business, lean on them and stay in this area of, I mean, it, it, it's more than discomfort. I've never been so uncomfortable in my life. Stay in this area of complete discomfort, knowing that the way I felt was my hands were tied because I could only ask questions and I could only activate the team and I could only lead us towards where I knew we were going and trust trust the team, uh, to surface the right information and, and the right, the right next steps to get us to, to where we need to go. But I, I say with complete conviction, I grew more in that time than I think I ever have as a leader because I, I had to be a leader. I, I had to not get into the disciplines, not, I couldn't do the work. I couldn't, I couldn't solve things on my own. Um, it forced me to, to fill my segment gaps and fill my knowledge gaps with people that had that technical knowledge and expertise and empower them to, to go, to go help us move forward. So I learned more than I can ever, ever tell you. And then what I learned too, outside of the leadership pieces I took away, which have definitely helped me to get to where I am today. Um, the other thing I learned was an incredible amount of empathy for what it takes to be in the product team, in a development team, um, in a SaaS business. Uh, I learned so much that has made me a far more empathetic CMO today, because I have that view. I, I understand what the product team is going through when um, requirements are coming in. I understand the, the pressure on the engineering team when uh, we have sub issues, et cetera. So it's made me not only a stronger leader, but a far more empathetic marketing leader and, and deeply respecting and understanding what the stakeholders around my, my three legs of the stool um, are going through. So learned a lot, but, but absolutely incredibly uncomfortable. And I, I'm not sure I could do it again. It's singly discipline focused. <laughs> well, when you're not sure when you could do it again, when you talk about the uncomfortability, it gets me thinking of something that we all went through as, I don't know, global society, which was COVID-19. And I wonder if there were any similarities or if there's anything you learned from that situation, that unfamiliar situation. Because for example, when I've written about we I've written about the hidden upsides of COVID-19 before, you know, and marketers would tell us they got out of a creative rut, they developed a new way of working. No one would want to go into that uncomfortable situation, but they came out differently and often in better ways. Yes. For you, I believe, you were working in the manufacturing industry, which, you know, supply chain issues, factory shutdowns, you can't work from home, <laughs> you know, building things in the manufacturing industry. So for you, like, what, what did you learn? Were there similarities in that uncomfortable situation? Were there other things you learned that changed you and made you a better marketer or a better business leader today? Yeah, during, during, during COVID-19. Absolutely. Right. Cause you were yeah, in manufacturing, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Well, actually it's so interesting. So, um, I was over, over in the manufacturing industry at, at PTC right before COVID and then had come back to Autodesk, um, right as COVID sort of was really accelerating. So I, but I was in this role that we're talking about during COVID, which was, oh. so it was doubly hard, Daniel, like it was doubly hard. And <laughs> what I say is I wouldn't do it again. What I mean by that is I would absolutely do it again in context of, of having a team where, um, you know, I had the right leaders in place. Right. But I couldn't do it again in terms of standing up and, and saying I can run, I can successfully run a development organization. That's a lesson I learned, which is that's not for me and that's OK. Um, but I would hire the right people to do it on my behalf. And so when I was, um, yes, when COVID-19 hit, I was in this role. So I had like the double whammy. I had the double whammy of I'm super uncomfortable and in a role that's completely out of anything I've ever known before. And I know I don't understand the lingo and I don't understand the discipline. Oh, and I can't even get together in person um, with the <laughs> leaders on my team to gain trust and uh, seek to understand them outside of, of work in a way that you just have more abilities to do when you're not sitting across the Zoom. Um, so, yeah, that, that was sort of a double whammy. But I also say that, that that did accelerate in the same way being uncomfortable did in the role, it also accelerated some of my, my leadership skills, my ability to build empathy, because all of us were, were in that same boat. And we we're all trying to build trust with each other at the same time when you could only do it over a little, a little screen. Um, so that was equally hard, equally as hard, for sure. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, so talking about building empathy, I mean, that's a great way to build empathy. Talk about, I know, you know, in my career too, sometimes you're like, ah, I just want the software built or this IT. Why, why is IT taking so long? I think there's great empathy there. But empathy for the customer, that's something we talked about. As I mentioned this in the opening. I love this. Your lesson is you have to walk in your customer's shoes literally and you did this literally. So you want to take us through like how you got the idea to do this and then how it all worked out? Oh, yes. So I I mean, anyone that knows me, um, I think would say, yes, this is Sarah, meaning I think about the customer all the time. And there's something we haven't talked about yet, but it's important context to set. Um, I am in this role uh, mainly because I care so much about the construction industry. I mean, of course, I also have to have you know, experience and knowledge and, and a team, et cetera, that make that possible. But I care so much about the construction industry. It's it's why I was in uh, many of the roles I had for so long. I'm, I'm fascinated by how, how things are designed and, and built. And I think the built process is, is incredibly complex. And so um, anyone that, that has worked with me or works for me or with me, I think would say the same thing. I'm incredibly passionate passionate about this industry. And I'm incredibly passionate about what that means as a marketer or as a go to market strategist or a business strategist on what that means in terms of how you resonate with customers. And I truly believe, as you articulated really well, Daniel, that you have to walk in their shoes. Literally, you have to put on the steel toe boots if you're, you're in an industry like construction and you have to go out and you and it cannot be a day where temperature is perfect. Your sun is at the right angle. Everything's great. You're not freezing cold. You cannot do it on those days. And if you do, you need to augment them with days that are, are the complete opposite of that because it's the only way to experience what customers experience and to really deeply understand the obstacles they have to overcome, like such as like when you're in construction and it's freezing out, you number one, you have to wear safety gloves uh, as part of your, your, your personal protective equipment. So that in and of itself is a challenge to use things like phones or uh, et cetera, et cetera. But imagine when you're out on a construction site and it's freezing cold and you need to take a sip of coffee and you can barely even you know, pick up the coffee cup with your, your gloves on and you take them off for a second and your hands freeze. I mean, it is no joke to, to be out there and see what your customers go through uh, build a high degree of empathy for it. And then I truly believe that is the only way as marketers to then be able to translate the business problems your customers face into how solutions can help help them solve real world problems. And I, I think you can't do it from afar. I think COVID really made that challenging for, for all of us as marketers because it was very difficult to get out into actual construction sites if you're in construction or factories, if you're in manufacturing, you had to do everything virtually, which gives you some degree of empathy because you can ask the right questions and you can um, dive deep into particular areas, one-to-one -one or one-to-few. But when you actually go and see how a customer does the work that they have to do, it's eye opening. Um, and we have an initiative right now where we're making sure anytime we travel as a team, if we can, and we have permission to do so, we will go to a customer job site. Uh, and it's, it's eye opening for the team too. I watch them, the, the eyes are like saucepans. Um, cause it's things you can never, you can never appreciate it till you, till you're there. And, you know, I happen to be in an industry that you know, is incredibly complex and you're talking multi-story skyscrapers sometimes, right. Or high rise commercial buildings and the level of complexity that goes into that just in terms of safely transmitting materials, making sure people are safe on the site. It's very difficult to imagine it until you're there. And I had, uh, I had the, the real pleasure recently of going out to um, a site, uh, an oil refinery, which is completely different than a building construction project. And you're in hazmat suits and you have uh, little alarms on you in case you enter into an area that has your dust particles that you shouldn't be around. And you realize, gosh, People do this day in, day out, and they're stepping over uh, obstacles that are there because they're at a certain phase of a project. And it makes you think differently about if that is the customer that I'm trying to reach. First of all, how do I reach them when they're on a construction site all day? And you have to think creatively about that. And then how do you... Um, show that you have a deep empathy for what they do and that you're there to position something to them that can be helpful to them. So I'm a huge believer in it. Huge. And it doesn't matter if you're not in construction, whatever industry you're in, B2C, B2B, I truly believe 
you have to experience things through the eyes of your customer. Um, and you have to do it regularly and frequently because once isn't enough and you have to be them. You have to, in my world, right, wear the boots, wear the hazmat suits, put on the hard hat, be freezing to death because you're out uh, in the wintertime in the in the open air. Um, and you have to watch and see how things get done so that you can intimately understand how to appeal to them and truly connect with them based on who they are, the business challenges that they face and, 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 and what they're looking to solve to, to do their work more effectively or more productively. So it's something I take really seriously. I try to do it as much as I can. Like I mentioned in the beginning, one of my thirds of my time every single day is something focused on external customers. I push my team really hard to get out there on construction sites too, or even listen in on phone calls if we can't be there physically in person. Um, but it is something that I truly believe to be a good marketer, you have to have to, in fact, not even good to market anything. I truly believe you have to intimately understand the customer that you're trying to reach. And that takes walking literally in their shoes. So I hear you saying, I want to learn about the customer and I hear you saying this and it sounds good, but I also got to admit, I am incredibly introverted. It sounds so awkward. And so I wonder if you had any tips on how you actually physically like executed on this, because I've heard this, you know, people have talked about this on, on the podcast. I, I remember interviewing a uh, Radhika Dougal, chief marketing officer of super on how I made it marketing. She talked about, she shared a story when she was at chase, she spent hours outside of Western unions and payomatics to understand underbanked customers. And again, boy, that sounds, Oh my gosh, you'd learn so much. And then I think of like, my gosh, that sounds so awkward. Like how would I actually do that? So I think there's probably a lot of people listening and they're nodding. They're like, yeah, that's great. Getting the customer's shoes. But then thinking of like, Oh my gosh, actually doing this with my customers. Do you have any advice on how you you actually execute on this and and actually make it happen? Yeah. I mean, it's back to the, it's back to the tripod, right? Or the three legs of the stool. So, um, you know, anytime the, 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 let's just say like anytime I wanted to go, go on a construction, I say I wanted to go on one next week. Um, it would start with me leaning on my tripod, like leaning on sales who usually has the relationship or customer success, um, and saying, Hey, you know, I'm going to be in, just make it up. I'm going to be in Texas next week. Um, I know we have a customer there. I would love to go see their construction site. And so it's activating your internal network who probably have relationships to help you get there, which by the way, is also super important because it shows your stakeholders that you're, you're curious, you're asking them to collaborate with you. You're showing them that you're doing things to get closer to the customer, which always as a result will help them drive revenue goals or retention goals. Um, so leaning on that internal network is, is number one way to do it, to do it. If you don't have direct access to the customer yourself. And then the second thing I would say is, um, even if you're introverted, and by the way, I'm an incredibly introverted person. I just get super passionate about things, which makes me appear more. Are you really? You don't seem introverted at all. I, I gotta say, you are introverted too. I am introverted. I am introverted. Okay. I get activated. Like if I get passionate about something, I woo, I can go for hours. Um, okay. But I would say my advice there is, all you have to do, and it sounds so simple, but I promise you, it works. All you have to do is ask a few questions, and customers, it doesn't matter who they are, they will go. They will go because just like I am introverted and I'm being extroverted now, I'm extroverted because I'm passionate about this topic. I'm passionate about what I do. I'm passionate about the customers in the industry that I serve. It's no different when I engage or anyone engages with a customer. You just need two, three, two, three questions. They will go. And then from there, you can take it in any direction you want, but it can be as simple as tell me about your day. They'll go. What's your biggest challenge? They'll tell you. And then they'll probably tell you three more. Um, how do you overcome that? Uh, how do you drink coffee when you have these gloves on and you can barely pick up the coffee cup and it's freezing cold out? They'll tell you. So I lean very much on um, curiosity. And it can just be as simple as two, three, th- two, three questions. And it will naturally, naturally flow naturally flow. People love telling you about what they do and why they do it. Uh, cause they're passionate about it. I've never had a situation where it's sort of been ask a question, they've answered it and it's gone quiet. Never. If anything, we've gone past the time we're supposed to be engaging together. Uh, we've entered into new parts of the project in my world, right? Which could be the same if you're on the phone call, you just go into different areas of conversation. People love to share what they do because generally they're passionate about it. And so even if you're introverted, I think it's just find the one or two things that, that you want to ask, be curious, the rest will happen naturally. 
Well, that's great. That's great. And uh, that level of collaboration, I mean, that is something now that we will talk about in the second half of the episode of How I Made It in Marketing. But before we get there, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs Institute, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. You can get 10,000 marketing experiments working for you with a free trial of the MechLabs AI Guild at mechlabs.com slash AI. That's M-E-C-L-A-B-S dot com slash AI to get artificial intelligence working for your marketing marketing campaigns. Uh, all right. So as I mentioned, you talked about some great collaboration there. I mean, you've, met, you've talked about that throughout the episode, but also like in, you know, reaching out and to get to know these customers to find these customers you can work with. Uh, let's talk about the first person you mentioned that you collaborated with, Karen Doss Becker, you said from Karen, you learned to set and declare your expectations. So how did you learn this from Karen? Oh, so uh, this this goes back in, in the time machine. And and I, I do hope she she hears this and listens to this because she had a uh, she had a huge impact on me and, and I don't know if she, if she quite knows how much, but, um, so this, this was a long time ago now. I mean, several years ago, eight, nine years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, Karen, uh, at the time was working in brand marketing and I was over in, uh, industry marketing, business strategy, industry marketing. So, and again, same industry. So I was deep in you know, what do contractors care, contractors care about what is happening in the construction industry. And Karen was coming in more as as, um, how do we build brands? How do we establish brand awareness? And so we were coming from two different worlds, but when we came together and she was, she was, um, my boss at the time, it felt like two halves of the world making a whole. So she was very good at thinking about, well, how do we want to be perceived? What is the sentiment? What is our share of voice? And I was sort of a little bit down further and, okay, well, how do we, how do we speak to these customers? We know their business problems. Um, how do we connect with them? And so it was this very defining moment where it was very synergistic, the two, the two of us coming together. And I would watch Karen because um, she didn't know at the time anything about the industry because she'd been focused, as I was mentioning, sort of bigger, bolder brand awareness, not so singular industry focused. And so I was watching Karen because she was positioned in this role um, now on the industry side, but didn't know anything about the industry. And I would watch her and I would think to myself, wow. I want to be like Karen, like she would walk into a room and, um, she would be curious. She would ask questions. She would communicate back her understanding and then she would declare. And by declare, I mean, she would declare what she was going to go do as a result of what she'd heard. She would declare what her expectations were in a good way, constructive way of her stakeholders. And then she would declare to the team, you know, what she expected of the team. And it was so clear so concise. Um, and she, and she taught me, and I, I think of her all the time. She taught me to take a, sometimes a different position than jumping straight to how to solve something. She used that beginning part of how she showed up to be curious, communicate back what she heard. And then often, you know, people will be like, that's not what I said, or that's not what I, I hoped you would take away from that. So then there'll be iteration along the way, but it would get to the point at some point, right. Where there was, there was, um, alignment. So she would declare back what, she, excuse me, she would communicate back what she heard. And then she was very directly, uh, and getting buy-in as she did it, sort of declaring what the expectations were of, of herself, her team, and then what she was going to need from her stakeholders to move it forward. And she did all this uh, in an environment that was new to her in terms of the team she was managing, the stakeholders she was working with, an environment in which she didn't understand the industry. So she wasn't as familiar with what the customers needed or who they were or how they operated. But she had this confidence um, and she set clarity. She provided clarity to everybody around her of what was going to happen next. And then she leaned on people like myself and others on the team to then go fill it in. So if her expectation was X, then we would help her, you know, say, okay, if that's X based on the industry and what we know about it and the customers, here's what we can do. Like, here's how we're going to go to market or here, here's what we propose we, we do next. And so what I learned from her was the importance of gaining that clarity of gaining that, um, alignment, excuse me, right? Say back what you heard, make sure you continue that conversation until there is alignment, then, uh, declare, declare what it is that you're going to go do and then work with the team to, to help you make sure what you declared is viable and possible. And so she brought to me this whole sense of, um, 
clarity, like making sure that I was curious, not seeking straight to solve, making sure I had buy-in with my stakeholders by saying back, you know, what I'd heard and, and making sure there was that alignment. And then she empowered me and others on the team to say, this is what I'm going to go do about it. Uh, and declaring that meant there was buy-in. People knew how to hold each other accountable. People knew what others were going to go do. And uh, it brought clarity to, to at a time that felt chaotic. Um, and I keep her in mind all the time when I think about projects being complex and teams going to go changes all the time. I think back to those days of working for Karen and Karen saying, be curious, communicate back for alignment and then declare, declare what you expect of yourself, what you expect of your team and what you expect of your stakeholders. And it's a recipe that I've lived by. It, it works. And I, I, I credit it to her because before then I was the first in, in the room to listen. Cause I am, I am introverted, uh, listen over process in my head and then come back with a solution versus making sure. And sometimes that solution would be wrong because I didn't take the moment to make sure we were all on the same page. Did I hear things the way that it, they were intended to be heard? Did I perceive things in the way that the person uh, you know, asking for the support or asking for the help, expecting me to perceive them. So she taught me to slow down. She taught me not to jump straight to solving. She taught me to, yeah, be curious, ask the right questions, gain alignment, and then declare, declare what you expect, declare what you expect of others and declare what you expect as an outcome. So I think of her often. So when you first talked about Karen, it was great. You're talking about how you're like two halves of the of a whole, or I forget exactly how you talked about like this great, this great match made. And I wonder now, as a marketing and business leader, you know, we mentioned you have a team of about 300. Is there anything you intentionally do to try to fit people together or teams that you know will will fit together in that way? I because I know, like in our careers when we've had that, I just, it, it always feels like kind of like serendipity or kismet or you just happen to team up with the right person. But I mean, that is great leadership at the end of the day, right? Fitting the right parts together. So you, you seem like you're ready to jump into this. What, what have you been doing to make that happen? Oh, I, I think about this all the time. And it's funny, Daniel, because I actually, I hadn't thought about it um, connected to what I just shared with the Karen story and that framework that she installed in my mind. But now that I think about it, what happened with Karen and I and that that those two halves coming coming as a whole, that is the philosophy I use with my team. Oh, absolutely. Um, so we're actually to be open, we we've just gone through a bit of a change in my team. So I'm still relatively new here. So so we've changed a lot in terms of my my organizational structure, my leadership team. Um, and I have intentionally put people in roles uh, where they're forced in combination with each other to make a whole. So people that have very deep brand experience are coupled with people that have very deep industry experience or coupled with people that have very deep analytics experience with people that, that have very deep experience of how to run sort of full customer journey programs, et cetera. So, so yes, I think about that a lot all the time. Uh, how do we have intentional connectivity, both in terms of uh, discipline skills, so brand complemented with industry to make that whole like Karen and I were at the time. Um, I take that to heart when I'm building teams, uh, hiring for teams. And even when I look down in, in my leaders teams too, I, I think that is, it's so important. It's so important. You have to have, you have to have people that um, have the discipline specific skills in certain areas, but are able to work with others. And that comes to you know, driving the trust creating the trust, creating the collaboration opportunities, because they have to then bring that together and work as a whole. But yes, I do want to call that very much. Let's talk about someone else uh, you collaborated with and learned from. You mentioned Scott Reese, the CEO of GE Digital, and you said you learned to coach and simply ask questions, don't dictate. And so I see some similarity in themes there in terms of asking questions. But talk, talk to us, how is uh, declaring different than dictating? And why should you do one and not the other? And how'd you learn this from Scott? Yeah, let, let me, I'll, I'll first sort of take the declaring versus dictating. So um, I use the word declaring when I think about, about Karen, because um, it was sort of a declaration. It, it was not a dictation by any sense. She was, she would always declare, right, here's what I expect, or here's what I am going to do as a result of being aligned with this, or here's what, you know, I want us in, as an organization to, uh, to live by in terms of values or norms. So I use the word declare. Uh, in my mind, it sort of defines the articulation of how I, how I saw Karen um, operating that way, very, very clear and pointed about what, what she expected and what she was going to do. Um, 
Scott, uh, and Scott, so before he was the CEO, he was a senior executive at Autodesk. I worked with Scott uh, for a long time from afar and then had the real pleasure of, of working for him before he, he, right before he left actually to go over to GE too. And um, uh, the word dictate there is, is, is what I have seen sometimes um, in, in many, many different roles, right? You, you come across people sometimes that um, tend to dictate, meaning I'm going to tell you what to do and I just want you to go do it. And there's not much room, right, for, for innovation or for uh, challenging that or, or collaborating on perhaps a different outcome. Um, don't see that very often, by the way, but I think sometimes that's, you know, it's a little bit of a stereotypical overgeneralization, but you do see some people who are just, I know what we need to do. I just need you to go do it. What Scott brought to the table and I saw it from afar and then saw it you know, even more intimately when I worked for him was he would always take this approach, uh, no matter what the situation was, whether it was um, uh, a, a brainstorming situation and we're trying to get to a different outcome or there was a real business challenge and we were trying to think through how to solve it. Scott always took the approach of where can I help you? Uh, what can I do that, that might, that might help you get to your next step? Or he would ask things such as, how is your team doing? Um, what do you think your team could, could, could learn from you or what could you share with your team that would help them get to the next level? And it sounds so simple, but it's honestly one of the most effective approaches I've seen because, and I don't, and I'm sure knowing Scott, cause he's an extremely, extremely smart person. I am sure he knew sort of, uh, what he was intending to do here, but, but my, what I experienced when he would ask this was a couple of things. One, it made me stop. Like it, it made me, it made my brain stop for a moment and go, Oh, well, that's a different, that's a different question. Um, what can I do? What do, what do I need help with? Are there things I'm not thinking about that maybe I'm not seeing clearly? So it almost, it almost forced the, the hamster motion, right? Of your, the hamster in the wheel, you're trying to solve something. Um, you're going super, super fast. It caused me, if I'm the hamster in that case to stop the wheel and go, huh, well, that's interesting. What, what do I need? Um, where am I stuck? And so it, it forced a different conversation. So it slowed things down, forced a different conversation. And then the third thing that it did for me personally was it made me realize, um, this is me being vulnerable. It made me realize that no matter what the situation was, whether it was a team situation or we were trying to problem solve something, um, or we were, uh, working on a plan for, for reports out, whatever it was, it made me realize I wasn't alone. And I think that's really, really, really important. Um, and that's important to me because I do being introverted tend to process and overthink. Um, I have very high expectations of myself. Um, and I can swirl, I can get lost in my, okay, I have to solve this. I have to solve this before I go back to the team. I have to solve this. And what Scott made me do is not only slow down, but, um, also recognize I'm not in it alone. There's, there's, there's Scott, there's my other leaders in my peer group. There's my entire organization that that's here too. Um, and he taught me a very important skill there, uh, in terms of recognizing that you don't have to have all the answers. Don't be afraid to ask for help because people actually want to help you. And I also found that in going through the process of slowing down and thinking about the questions he was asking me, I realized I did know what to do or, or I knew how to get to the next step, but I wasn't activating it because I was trying to get all the way, all the way to the end. And so I just found his approach incredibly effective. Um, it really made me think, and I watched him do this with countless of other people too. And I, I'm pretty sure from the read I saw in the rooms, virtual and in person, it caused the same reaction for them. It slowed people down. It made them think through maybe where they did need to be asking for more help or where they were really stuck and, and maybe needed someone else to come in and, and guide them or seek a different perspective. And it also made people recognize that we're all in it together. And, and I really like that and truly believe that that kind of questioning um, leads to a different outcome that I guarantee has a, has a bigger and broader impact at the end, because it wasn't one person sitting there swirling, trying to solve something. Um, and, and it was a, an approach that allowed for ideation and, and greater collaboration. So I credit that to him because I try and do that in my role too, being introverted and being, um, someone that processes and being someone that wants to get to the answer. I can have a tendency, I wouldn't say to dictate, but I can have a tendency to say, 
okay, this is the challenge, but I know how we're going to solve it. So he's taught me to, uh, even if I might know the answer and oh gosh, I hardly ever do, but even if I do, um, I've taught myself through the frameworks that, you know, he's shown me and the way that he's approached things to not share the answer. Let's get there together. That that's, that's the best way people get buy-in from it. You use the whole team. Um, you become a coach with your team versus someone that's maybe dictating how to do something or telling them the answer. Um, so I credit that approach a lot to him. It was the first time I saw him do it. It was starkly different than I've seen other people do before. Just a simple question of how can I help you? Very stuck. <laughs> I just want to go on the records. I'm still skeptical that you're introverted, by the way. Let's just be clear about that. <laughs> um, but I also want to mention, this sounds like a great approach, too, when you're coming in new to an organization. And you mentioned a lot of questions. I wonder if there was any specific questions you asked coming in new to an organization that really helped you as well. Because as we mentioned, you've been here about a year. It's a large public company. It's You have a team of 300. It looks like you're working at home. I imagine it's pretty geographically distributed. Mm -hmm. So it can be hard to kind of build that type of rapport that we're talking about when it's very remote, different time zones, different countries, different cultures, you're new. So have you taken the same approach or, or are there specific questions that have helped you coming in new to a role? Oh, I have taken the same approach. Um, and again, it, it's interesting because I'm having this moment now where I, I look back on myself even over the past year and you know, I've evolved a lot and I, I credit a lot of that evolution to, to great, great mentors, great bosses and great peers. Um, and, you know, we've mentioned a few of them here today, but yes, uh, I have spent about nine months on what I call a listening tour. And, and it really has been, Daniel, a listening tour. I have just simply asked a couple of questions um, to individuals and to teams, both within my organization and outside my organization to get a pulse for how do they do their work? How do they feel about their work? How do they feel about who they have to collaborate with? And how does that, how does that work? Um, what are they worried about? What's not working? Um, I've changed the questions depending on the team that I'm speaking to, because sometimes I have more context than other, uh, but that's the general tone. Uh, yes. So yes, yes, yes. I have spent nine months, um, asking questions, not solving, really trying not to solve. I mean, I will admit there's a few things that have moved into solve mode, but collectively with, with stakeholders. Um, but yes, I have really tried hard over the past nine months to seek to understand, um, to listen intently and then communicate back leaning on what I learned from Karen, communicate back what I've heard um, to make sure that, that what I've heard is, is accurate of, of what people intended me to, to take away and, and hear from them. But yes, nine months asking just a handful of questions to get a good pulse uh, of, of what is working, what's not working, where are there are opportunities for greater collaboration, um, where are things that work so well that are aligned to the culture that we have to maintain and continue forwards. By the way, I want to mention uh, for anyone listening to that communicate it back is so good for any relationship, not just business. I mean, I've used it with <laughs> my wife, with my children. Like it is so really helpful to make sure you actually understood what's going on, especially in emotionally charged situations. I, I love that. Um, speaking of family, actually, let's talk about one last lesson here from someone you collaborate with. It is actually your family. It's your father, Mark yes. Hodges, who is a former CCO and is now a retiree. And you said uh, you learned from him to believe in yourself. So how did you learn this from your father? Oh, this one, you, know, you can't help but get slightly emotional, I think, when you're, you're talking about people that are close to you. But um, I, I think I've, I'm so lucky. Um, my dad is a huge part of my life, always has been. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for that. But he's also been a, a huge part of my professional life. So my dad was mechanical engineer by by profession and and moved into into tech uh really after after university and so i grew up um grew up just outside of, of london in the uk and had a sister or have a sister i should say um and i grew up listening to my dad come home and because he would travel a lot and talk about how technology was changing at the time, the manufacturing industry that he was working in, like product design. So he would travel and meet with car manufacturers and watch watch designers and manufacturers. And uh, you know, he would just he would talk about how what they did using pen and paper was was changing um, through technology. And I never really understood what on earth he was talking about, but thought it was so cool that he would travel to the states and travel to Asia and, and come back with these stories. And of course, my sister and I would always always get little, little chotskis and, and takeaways from the places that, that he'd visited. And so 
it wasn't until I was much older that I, I, and I got my introduction into tech, I realized what he was talking about. And I realized, oh my goodness, technology does change the way things are done. And frankly, it's, it's part of my obsession with the construction industry, seeing the massive transformation the industry is under and, and the role in which technology can play there. So um, I give that as context because I, I was lucky in that growing up, in an environment like that, where my dad had a, you know, a discipline-specific area of focus in mechanical engineering, and then making his way into tech, there was lots of parallels when I when I entered into the tech space as well. And so, um, I've been really lucky because I can share share things I'm challenged with with my dad, and he's been in the, he was in the software tech world for so long that there are lots of parallels. So he could often help me problem solve and coach. But he's taught me many many important things. But I, I honestly think the most important one is to believe in yourself. And I know he's said this to my sister and I probably the entirety of our lives. Um, but I've heard it and listened to it more, I think, in, in recent years where uh, I think all of us suffer sometimes from a little bit of imposter syndrome. And, um, you know, I, I always have in any role I've ever had. I've always sort of been, well, how, 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 how am I going to do this? And felt overcome with the, uh, the thought of being responsible for a very important project or then being responsible for a small team. And then those teams getting bigger and bigger. Um, and my dad constantly reminds me, you just have to believe in yourself. That's it. You just have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that you're capable. Uh, you have to have you know the confidence to make hard decisions. But at the end of the day, like you control it. And if you believe in yourself, that comes across to other people too who who see that. Um, and if you believe in others, they're going to help you get there. So he's always been um, always been a mentor. Always been at my side. Always been able to give coaching advice. Um, but even in my my most vulnerable moments, he always reminds me of that. You, you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. And, and he's right. I think the more you believe in yourself, the more confident you become, uh, the more open to overcoming problems and sharing your problems and working collectively with others. It just becomes easier. Uh, and you get out of your head, get out of your head of, I can't do this. There's no way I can do this. It's not possible for me to do this. You start positive. You remind yourself you can do anything if you put your mind to it. Um, and it changes the behavior. It changes your internal behavior, for me at least. And it changes my external behavior, too, and how I work with others. So very lucky to have, have him in my life. Yeah, I mean, what a treasure to have your father being in a similar industry to what you're doing and seeing that up close. And I wonder, seeing that up close, what did you learn? What did your dad teach you about finding a good work-life balance? Because, you know, <laughs> a lot of times we talk about this. I mean, it is a marketing podcast. We talk about things like influencer marketing, right? We forget we're human beings, too, who we influence those who are closest to us. Your dad influenced you. You influence your kids. And I wanted to mention this. So uh, this is going to be about episode 81, somewhere around there. I, I looked uh, with your application. We've had 3,116 applications so far. Wow. And I mention this because you did something in your application that none of those other 3,116 people did. A lot of people mention work-life balance. You mentioned specific games you play with your family and friends. You mentioned <laughs> you had a list. Here. Junior Monopoly, Sleeping Queens, Taco and Goat Cheese Pizza, Legos. I didn't even... <laughs> I didn't even hear of the goat cheese thing. And and so to me, it seemed like, you know, a lot of, like I mentioned in the, in the opening about um, buzzwords and how we use these buzzwords, work-life balance has become a buzzword. And I'm sure that other people have believed it, but the way you went into detail makes me feel like this is something you've really thought through. So <laughs> like I said, you, you saw your dad up close. It's so great. Now your kids are seeing you up close. What have you learned from your dad that you're trying to pass down to your kids about work-life balance, even if they're in a totally different industry from you? Yeah. Oh, that's so I, I laughed when you asked me about the work-life balance and now I'm laughing because I forgot that I put those in my application, but it's true. And I'm going to talk <laughs> about that in a second. Um, yeah. I mean, my dad worked really hard. I mean, he's one of the hardest working people I've, I've ever, I've ever met. Um, but having said that when my dad, when I was growing up would come home from work and this was before the time of blackberries and, and cell phones. Right. So I will, I will say, um, probably a little bit easier, but when he came home from work, he was home from work and he was dad. Um, weekends, he was dad. Uh, vacations, he was dad. He very rarely spoke about work um, other than if he was coming home from a trip and, and we were curious about it. But my dad didn't bring his work home. Um, when he was home, he was involved in sports with us. Uh, games were a huge part of our life too. My, my grandparents always played games with us as well. So that's just sort of been a thread. Um, so my dad get, did a very good job of when he was home. He was not Mark Hodges at work. He was he was my dad. Um, and I think he's, he's in 
he's definitely left an impression and installed that in me. Um, my job is very demanding. I love my job. I, I work very hard. I find it very difficult to turn off because I am so passionate. And so if you're passionate about something, you can't just, I don't believe you can just turn a switch. Um, but I am very intentional about when my day is done or it's a weekend, uh, or we're away. It is all about my daughter and my, my husband and we play games because if you're playing games or you're playing with Lego, which is another thing I love to do, you cannot be on your phone. You cannot be side glancing at Slack. Like you have to be present and you have to be in that moment. And so, um, that's very important to me. I take it very seriously. Um, we do play a lot of card games, sleeping Queens, uh, taco goat cheese pizza is a great one. If anyone's got you know, younger children out there. Uh, but I think it's incredibly important, but I will be the first to say again, back to being vulnerable. Cause I think that's, that's super, super important to me as a person. It is hard. It's hard to, put things in balance. I mean, I, I travel a lot too, and I wouldn't change any of that for the world because I, I love what I do. And I believe in this company and I believe in what we're, we're trying to accomplish. Um, but I also am a mom and a wife and a friend, uh, and a sister and a daughter. And those things are very important to me too. So you, you have to prioritize it. You have to prioritize it. And my dad always prioritized us and still does. Um, just sometimes you have to get creative around it. Like sometimes you have to be away, but when I'm home, I'm home and I may, I try my best to make up for that. Um, and I play every game I put on that list <laughs> that I send you. <laughs> uh, no, I love that. And you know, something I learned early in my career from a, a marketing leader, uh, this was back when Blackberries are big. She always said like, wherever you are, be there, like be fully there. And yes. what she was talking about, and this is very true at home too, but what she was talking about, she's like, you know, you go to conferences, a lot of people work remotely. You didn't see them even back then. It's just because it's a geographically distributed international organization, right? You just work in different offices. And then she said, you see two people at conferences catching up and they're like, oh, like half talking and half looking at a Blackberry. She's like, put the damn thing down <laughs> and just be there with someone. And so I love that, that you're not only hopefully doing that work too, but you're doing that at home with your family. Yeah, um, I love that. You have to be present. I, 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 that's really well said. I, I really believe that. Like, if you are at the gym, be at the gym. Don't be on your phone. Yeah. If you are at work, be at work. Or if you're at a conference, you know, be networking. Um, if you're at home, be home and and be home doing whatever it is that you enjoy. My family and I happen to enjoy games, and it keeps us engaged and entertained. And but I, I love how you said that. Be present wherever you are. Yeah. Be present. Well, and a lot of these lessons we've talked about. And the little qualities of marketers we've talked about are not just qualities of good marketers, it's of good humans. Like I like yeah. your story about putting yourself in the customer shoes, actually wearing the boots. If we weren't marketers talking about KPIs and quarterly numbers and customer intelligence or whatever, it'd just be like, well, that's a pretty good human being, right? That's a good human characteristic to have to put yourself in other shoes of other people that you pass through in different walks of life, right? But because mm -hmm. we're marketers, it's like, well, this is good customer intelligence. So let's do this, right? <laughs> this is this is a good way to look good in an organization. Uh, which brings up my final question is um, we've talked about a lot of different things about what it means to be a marketer. What are the key qualities of an effective marketer? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so mine, uh, I actually think the ones that I'm going to um, share may be indicative of, yeah, I, th I think that they are, they're not marketing specific, but I think for me, they, they absolutely apply to, to, to my world and what I look for. Number one is curious. We've said that word a lot today, um, but I think that's so important. I, I think you have to be curious. You have to ask questions. You have to be willing to be uncomfortable. Um, you have to be willing to challenge status quo. Um, you, you have to be curious. And, and I think that makes a wonderful, wonderful marketer. Um, the second one for me is you do have to be collaborative. I mentioned it earlier. Um, I see if I visualize, if I visualize functions in an organization, I just did it with my hand here, right? You tend to have vertical functions. You have a sales organization, you have a product organization. I see marketing horizontal, because everything marketing has to do has to sit across all those functions in order to enable us to go to market in the right way. And so to do that, you have to be collaborative. You have to be able to collaborate within your own team and your own organization, but you have to be able to collaborate with other stakeholders that sit adjacent to you as well. So the, my second one would be, you have to be, you have to be collaborative. Um, the third one I would say is, uh, I think you have to be, you have to be empathetic. We've talked about that a lot today too. I think you have to be willing to, um, 
dispel any biases that you have. You have to be willing to put yourself in the shoes of not just the customer, but you have to be willing to put your shoes in the, in, in the shoes of the product team. Like I was sharing earlier, uh, that was the most uncomfortable I've ever been in my entire career running a development team, but I was in their shoes. Um, I realized, uh, you know, my feet are maybe not the right, the right size for those shoes, but, um, I was in their shoes and, and I, I think you have to build the empathy. You have to be willing to be empathetic. And the only way to be empathetic is to go and do those things. So for me, curious, you got to go ask the right questions. You got to be open and adaptable. Um, you have to be collaborative because the only way to do marketing, go to market is to collaborate with people around you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the last one is you have to be empathetic. You have to be empathetic to your stakeholders, to your customers, to your team. Um, that's a very important value. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. I learned so much from you today. It was a very comfortable conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. Same here. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com.